Six years ago, U.S. intervention under the Clinton administration, Obama administration rather, helped topple Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi from power. As Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton helped push for that intervention. And then this happened. That is the land of unconfirmed witnesses. Yes, we came, we saw, <laughs> he died. <laughs> did it have anything to do with your visit? No, oh, I'm sure it did. There she is bragging uh, about toppling the government of Libya. Pretty fun diversion for the Secretary of State. She's bragged about it for years after, but actual Libyans didn't find it as amusing. They've been suffering ever since. In the vacuum created by Gaddafi's fall, an ancient institution, in fact, has been revived, slavery. Glenn Reynolds is a law professor at the University of Tennessee. He recently wrote about this, and he joins us uh, tonight. Glenn, thank you for coming on. This is one of those stories where we just couldn't let it go. You know, you see these politicians make decisions, particularly foreign policy decisions. They declare victory, and no one checks to see what the aftermath is like. You did. Tell us what the effect of this decision was on the people of that country. Well, it's been a debacle, of course. Uh, it goes back to 2003 when we made an agreement with Muammar Gaddafi, the strongman who ran Libya, that if he would give up his weapons of mass destruction, we wouldn't try to overturn him. Uh, and we didn't keep that promise. Uh, in 2011, Hillary Clinton, uh, together with Susan Rice and Samantha Power and, and the Obama administration, decided to kick him out of power. Uh, they bombed and got rid of him, and as you can see, sort of gloated after he was uh, killed by a mob. And uh, there wasn't much of a plan on what to do next, uh, other than some advice uh, Hillary's advisor, Sidney Blumenthal, gave her about how to fit this into her presidential campaign plans. Uh, and now Libya's torn up with civil war. You've got fighting militias. Uh, you had a wave of refugees passing through uh, Libya. A lot of them got stuck in Libya, and now some of them are being sold essentially as slaves in slave markets uh, to work on farms and uh, that sort of thing uh, there. And CNN covered that, BBC covered that, and it became a story last week. And I saw it, and I thought, you know, uh, this is a real mess. <laughs> I mean, we heard about this, we knew it was bad, but years later, uh, Hillary has sort of gotten off, off scot-free on this. People don't bring it up, and yet this is a royal debacle. Uh, of course it is. And, and Susan Powers, I mean, Susan Rice and Samantha Power never hold to account for this. But I wonder what effect it has on the countries in the region around the world. I mean, next time we go to a leader, a strongman somewhere and say, look, you know, disarm and we'll reward you, why would anybody ever follow those instructions again? Oh, we're, we're ruined for a generation with this. I mean, right now, you know, we'd like Kim Jong-un to give up his news. Right. And uh, he probably wouldn't anyway, but we certainly can't make him any promises he'd believe because who would? That's, a, that's an excellent point. Has there been any soul-searching on the part of the people who did this? They wrecked an entire country and threw the whole region into chaos. Has anyone apologized or said, you know, maybe we've learned something from this? You know, not really. Uh, during the 2016 campaign, in one of the early primary debates when uh, Senator James Webb uh, was still uh, running, he raised the issue with Hillary and she just sort of blew it off and said, oh no, it was a big success. Uh, I've certainly never heard Samantha Power, who was pushing this uh, as part of an effort to establish a doctrine of international law called responsibility to protect as a justification for intervention, uh, never heard her say, oh, gee, we kind of blew that. Although you notice that responsibility to protect hasn't, didn't get brought up again after this. Of course not. Now that they're selling slaves in the market. One of the least impressive people ever to serve at a high level of government. Professor, thank you for bringing uh, this to the attention of our viewers. It's worth it. Thank you. Well, advances in artificial intelligence and robotics are causing the automation of more and more jobs, many jobs, and it's going to have a massive effect on working class employment in this country. Mike Rowe is here next to explain what's likely to happen. It may not be as apocalyptic as a Terminator movie, but robots do seem to be taking over the country. Automation has already eliminated millions of middle-class manufacturing jobs. Fast food restaurants are experimenting with burger-making robots. Soon, self-driving cars could remove the livelihood for millions of American truck, taxi, and delivery drivers. What will the future look like when machines have made human workers obsolete? Former Dirty Jobs host Mike Rowe has thought about this quite a bit, and he joins us tonight on set. Hey, Mike. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so is this, is this an, I mean, it feels like an ominous development, is it? Look, I'm, I'm neither a, a historian or an economist, but um, you know the Luddite Rebellion. Very well. Right. So 1820, 
Napoleonic Wars are over, times are hard in England, and uh, the weavers are upset because the looms are all the rage. Yes. And the looms are coming to take our jobs, and that was the meme, that was the trope, and then there was bloodshed. I think they hung a couple dozen of those guys by the time the dust settled. Yes. So from what I've read and from what I've seen, in some way, shape, or form, the robots have been coming since then. You know, from the cotton gin to our own industry, you know, we've talked about the displacement theory and the way that, um, you know, that, uh, that, that TV was going to destroy newspapers and that cinema was going to end television and how the Internet was going to end cinema. It never really happens the way we think it's going to happen. So I guess because of the show I used to do and because I'm running this foundation that's sort of work centered, people ask me all the time if the robots are, not if they're coming, but when and how bad is it going to be? Yeah, how bad is it going to be? Well, I don't know, but historically it's not going to be anywhere near as bad as we think. That's actually heartening uh, an optimist. as a prediction. So one of the things that technology has unleashed is the internet and the ability for people anonymously to make claims that are untrue. Yeah. And among the many claims that uh, are untrue on the internet is the mail enhancement company that apparently stole your identity. <laughs> really? Yeah, really. We're I mean, not that I would know, not that they emailed me or anything, but you were a, a false version. An ersatz Mike Rowe was selling mail enhancement products on the internet. To, with, with great success, apparently. <laughs> there was a very, very detailed advertisement, uh, along with a really uh, detailed interview that never took place with me. Okay, about my, uh, as my father put it, my problems in the boudoir. Uh, this was brought to my attention through an email that my dad sent me, which he, you know, he's like the town crier. He reads everything about me to my mother. He saw the ad and read the interview. And in the interview, I said that this new product that I had found made big changes, big, bold changes <laughs> for me. Transformed my life. Now, this, it's got, it's got my, my face, my name, and like three or four hundred words in quotes from me, ostensibly, explaining how life was sad and disappointing until I got my hands on whatever this stuff was, Testo Max, <laughs> ate it, and then stand back. I don't know how big this thing gets, right? It was bananas. <laughs> And so I had to explain to my mother and my father that the interview didn't take place, that I'm not a spokesman for a company that does this. And it was baffling because it wasn't just a fake ad. It was a fake ad that appeared on a fake page from Us Weekly. And it also appeared in a fake page from Sports Illustrated and Playboy. So what these companies do, you talk about fake news all the time, obviously it, it, it is what it is, but fake advertising has always led the charge. And so I went on the Facebooks and I wrote about the egregious claims and the humility of having to talk to your parents about the fact that you never needed the product in the first place. But uh, <laughs> was, it, was there any recourse? Did you get the ads taken down? Did well, they... the next day, I mean, no, there's nothing you can do because they constantly change the, like the algorithm behind. Right. It. So it's it's a, it's this shape shifting thing. But I got a call from the Better Business Bureau <laughs> the next morning saying, look, this was this is very brave of you to come out and talk about this. I'm not brave. I'm just annoyed. And I'm like, well, we should talk about really getting behind this because dozens of celebrities, yes, dad, I'm a celebrity, <laughs> have been, their names and likenesses have been co-opted to sell products that make you more all that. They've been selling Testo Max too. There's a fine line yes. between annoyed and brave. There really is. You know, I mean, it's incredibly blurry these days. <laughs> and, and, and in fact, I have no idea. It's a curved line. It's a, it, it's a curved line. I will stop with that. Mike Roth, it's always great to see you. Thank, Thank you. you. Sure. More news. We're keeping an eye on the tax vote. We'll bring the latest right after this.